Well, the Gospel of John tonight, the Gospel of John, and we'll start in chapter 1, John chapter 1, John 1. John chapter 1, we will start in verse 28 tonight. These things were done in Bethabara beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Now, <clears throat> Bethabara, the, the, the Jordan River runs from the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea, and Bethabara, Bethabara is on the uh, west side of the Jordan River, just before you get down to where it empties into the Dead Sea. So if you can picture Israel, picture the Dead Sea, the Jordan River, that is about where Jesus was when he was baptizing, or when John was baptizing. The next day John saith, Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man, which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And one of the most profound verses in the entire Bible, not that there are not many, and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Look over in John chapter 3, John 3. Here Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and uh, as best as we can tell, uh, he's in Galilee. Now, you have to remember that uh, how Israel is, at kind of top up there, you've got the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias, Gennesaret, called by different names. The Jordan River empties out of that, runs down the length of Israel to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea has no uh, uh, emptying it, a way to empty itself, uh, and it is dead. There is nothing. They say, well, it's trillions of dollars worth, or millions and billions of dollars worth of, well, if you don't think that they're there, that those Jews wouldn't have figured out some way to get those out. But anyway, uh, it goes down there, and... Uh, and on the west side of the, of the Jordan River, we, we find at the bottom Judea. And then in between, next up is the area of Samaria. And then at the top up by the Lake of Galilee is what is known as Galilee. Now, as you read the Gospel of John, um, as you read the Gospel of John, you will find there are many places, for example, in John chapter 4, they were baptizing. Uh, John was baptizing Enon near Salem. Now, there's an Enon in Salem up in Galilee, the northern province, but that doesn't really seem possible uh, because John was baptizing and Jesus was in Judea. There must have been another one. And so I did a little looking about it, and Enon, which is near Salem, really is on the opposite side of the river. Tell you what's really interesting. If you get your search engine out and uh, type pictures of uh, G where Jesus was baptized, I mean they have got that fixed up. You know, somebody said, you know, if I could get bap if I get baptized again, if I could, if I could, I'd take a hot flight over to Galilee and get baptized in the Jordan River. But anyway, so we're in chapter three. There is a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. And said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher, come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Now, th there are those who simply do not believe in the Trinity, but 
You cannot, in John chapter 1, help but read and see the Trinity in John chapter 1. It, as you read here in John chapter 3, you cannot help but see that. All right. Jesus answered and said unto him, Could I stop? Let me stop. Let me stop and do this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this evening. Bless your word. Help us as we study it tonight. And Lord, we'll praise your name for it. Lord, help us as we study your word to rightly divide it and to understand it and to get something from it tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. If I were to ask you tonight, this has nothing to do with the lesson. Well, it has something to do with the lesson. A little bit. If I were to ask you tonight this question, is Jesus God? You would all say, well, yeah. We just read there in, first, or in John chapter 1 that John bear record that this is the Son of God. All right? Jesus is God. Now, we would all agree with that. But if I ask you to prove that from the Bible, could you do that? If somebody would say to you, well, is Jesus God? Yeah, how do you know that? Because the preacher said so. No. The Bible says be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that lies within you. Let me just tell you, John chapter 8, last 15, 20 verses. If you ever want to be pressed on it, John chapter 8, the last 15 or 20 verses, there are verse after verse there. Um, in Isaiah 43, 11, it says, I, even I am the Lord. Beside me there is no Savior. There's only one Lord. There's only one Savior. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ's Lord. Joel's witness say, no, he's not the Lord. But if there's only one, either God was lying in 43, 11, where the angels were. And since we know God can't lie, then why would his angels lie? And Jesus must be God. Now, we read on. Verse 3. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Now, uh, let's read on before I say this. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Now, verse 5. Many have taken verse 5 and misapplied it. Except the man be born of water and of the Spirit. There are those who say, well, see right there, it says you've got to be baptized in order to be born again. That's not what that verse says. It's not saying that at all. There are a lot of different ways you could look at that verse, but the truth of the matter is that Jesus explains what he's speaking about in verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Jesus in verse 5 is talking about natural birth, and he's talking about spiritual birth. And he makes that very clear in verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You, can be, you must be born the first time in order to be born the second time. You cannot be born the second time until you've been born the first time. You say, well, duh. Yeah, but you'd be amazed at how many people take that verse and say, well, it's clearly teaching that you must be baptized, born of water spiritually, and born of the Spirit spiritually. So what it's talking about at all. Now, in John chapter 1 and in John chapter 3, I know in John chapter 1 we read about the baptism of Jesus. But in John chapter 1, he saw the Spirit 
descending like a dove. And I, when you, okay, we'll, we'll get wherever we get. When you read chapter 1, and John said, I didn't know who really he was. I, I, don't, I don't think John was lying there. But he must have had some idea about who Jesus was, at least to some degree. But he didn't know for sure until the Spirit of God descended upon him. Until the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. Here in chapter 3, we read again about the Spirit of God. It's amazing what people believe. You know, the Mormons believe that God and in Jesus, God, God the Father and Jesus, Jesus and the devil were brothers. I mean, they believe that. But they believe that God and Jesus lived on, in a world. Maybe not this world, but they lived in a world and they both died. And then God became the God of this world. And they believe that one day if you're a good person, that you too will die and you too will become the God of your own world. Now that's ridiculous. That is not true. But, you know, that's what they believe. The Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe. They do not, one, believe in the Trinity. And secondly, they do not believe that the Holy Spirit is God. They believe that he is an impersonable, an Im yeah, impersonable force. Look, if you would, at John chapter 15. John 15 for a moment. Verse 26. 15 and verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Now in the New World Translation, they translate it like this. But when the Helper, little h, is come, I will send him unto you, even the spirit, little s, of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. See, they simply don't believe it. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 for a moment. Verse 27. Verse 27. We could look at 26, likewise the Spirit, they would change that capital S to a little s. Again, in the same verse, in verse 27, And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. They change those capital S's to little s's. So now, I ask you this question tonight. Since you know how to prove that Jesus is God in the flesh, if someone confronted you on this matter, is the Holy Spirit truly God? Now, first of all, we would say, absolutely, preacher. We believe that the Holy Ghost is the third person of the Trinity, and we believe that he is God. But can you prove that? Well, it's again, say, well, the preacher says so, so it must be so. Well, I appreciate your confidence in me, but again, can you prove it from the Bible? Now, we believe that the Holy Spirit is a person, a real person. Now, we, we will go this, this, this much and say, well, he is a spirit, the Holy Spirit. And, and again, you only find in the New Testament the term Holy Spirit used together three times. Most of the time you find... Uh, uh, Holy Ghost used together, or you find simply the word spirit used by itself. Uh, we do find the Holy Ghost mentioned several times. Now, I'll give you one verse as we start. Look at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Let me give you a couple right here in this Acts that would say to us, the Holy Ghost is God. In Acts chapter 5, everybody knows the account here, the account of Ananias and Sapphira. Everybody knows that account. And uh, we read it, you know, about how Ananias and Sapphira 
conspired together to say we sold the property for this, and they really didn't. And again, we'll just say this, that it didn't matter what they sold the property for. If they had sold it for $100 and kept 50 for themselves and gave 50 to the church, that would have been no problem. Uh, there was nothing wrong with that. But that's not what they did. They sold it for $100, gave $50 to the church, and said, here we sold some property for $50, and here's the money. That's what they did that was wrong. Now notice verse 2, and kept back part of the price his wife also being privy to, to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, now verse 3 and 4 are, are our verses. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the Lamb? So we read in verse 3, that he lied to the Holy Ghost. That's who he lied to. But now notice what Peter says in verse 4. While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Now remember verse 3, he lied to the Holy Ghost. Here in verse 4, thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. See, Peter makes it very clear here in verses 3 and 4 that the Holy Ghost is God. He is God. Now, if a person is to be a person, we've said this before that a man is, that we believe men are tripart, body, soul, and spirit. Man is made up of his mind, emotions, and will. If a person is to be a person, he must have a mind and they must have emotions, and they must have will. Look quickly back at Romans chapter 8 again. Romans chapter 8. Does the Holy Spirit, does the Holy Spirit, now we're talking about is the Holy Spirit a person. We know that he is God. Is he a real person? Is the Holy Ghost a real person? Or as the Jehovah's Witnesses say, is he just merely an impersonable force that comes from God, but is really not God. Romans and verse 8, or chapter 8, I'm sorry, not verse 8. Romans. Verse 26, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind what is the mind of the Spirit? All right, a person is mind and emotions and will. A personality must have a mind, must have emotions, and must have a will. We see clearly then in, in chapter 8 and verse 27, the mind of the Spirit. So now we've got one-third of the part of a personality. We have the mind. Notice, if you, again, if you would again, look, if you would, at Ephesians chapter 4. All right, so then uh, a person, be a person, not only has a mind, but must have emotion, must have some kind of emotion. It says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, and grieve not, the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Grieve not. If you have a friend, if you have an acquaintance, if you know somebody, you know that if you say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, you can hurt their feelings. Now that's emotion. Everybody, everybody in the room tonight, unless you're dead, has some kind of emotion. You get upset. You get, you get uh, can we say it like this? You get happy. Uh, you get sad. Uh, you, you cannot be, in, in my observation, you can't be nothing. You've got something going on in that mind of yours. Maybe not much, but you got something going on up there. 
which will determine then your emotions. If I say, if I were to say uh, to you, uh, you're stupid. Now, you would hear it in your mind and it would affect your emotions. You, you'd be hurt. And in verse 30 says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit. Now, you say, well, how do we, we grieve? Now, there, there are two things about, there are three things really about the Holy Spirit. One, it says resist not the Spirit. We ought not to resist him when, when he you know, impresses something upon us. It says quench not. Quenching and resisting may go closely together, although they are different. Quenching means when the Holy Ghost definitely imp imp impresses upon you to do something. Now, if you're saved, I and I shouldn't say that. Since you are saved, since you are saved, I'm sure that there have been times that the Holy Spirit impressed you to do something and you did not do it. That is quenching the Spirit. For example, the Holy Spirit may have impressed you to say amen to something that somebody was saying in church. I'm not going to do that. People think there's some Holy Spirit may have impressed upon you. You need to sing. You need to let her rip. Let it go. I'm not going to do that. That is quenching the Spirit. When the Spirit said to Philip, go over to that guy in that chariot over there and talk to him a little bit. I'm not going to do that. But he did. But if he said, no, I won't do that, that is quenching the spirit. Now, grieving the spirit, grieving the spirit is, I think, just the opposite of that. Grieving the spirit is when the Holy Spirit impresses upon us not to do something, not to do it. He doesn't want us to do something, and, and you can fill in the blanks on that. Maybe he doesn't want you listening to something or watching something or reading something or going somewhere or doing something. I think all of us in the room that since we are saved can look back and say, I can remember times when the Holy Spirit really said, now don't do that. And I did it anyway. We're so like little kids. You tell a little kid not to do something, what's the first thing they do? They do what you told them not to do until you wear them out once or twice, and they won't do it anymore. But anyway, you know, it's like, and the Holy Spirit says, don't do that. So what do we do? We do it. We do it. That is grieving the Spirit. And when we grieve the Spirit, we hurt his feelings. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, number one, is God. But secondly, he is a very, very real person. Not only does a person have a mind, not only do they have emotions, but look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. Not only do we have a mind, not only do we have emotions, but we have a will. And our, our will, our will needs to be brought into conformity and and that's why God gives us parents, amen? And so that parents can teach us. Parents can show us the difference between right and wrong. Parents can show us what, uh, uh, now this is what I want you to do. I want you to, my mother would always say to me, I want you to make your bed. When you get up in the morning, I want you to make your bed. You know, and I, Why? I'm just going to get back in it, you know. So why would I, why would I do that? I usually don't tie my shoes. People at the bus go, "You're going to trip. You're going to trip. Why don't you tie your shoes?" Because I'm just going to untie them, you know. I think, you know. But our parents try to teach us to do right. Now I only told my mother maybe once or twice. Well, why do I need to make it? Because I'm just going to get back in it. My father taught, and my father tried to teach me a lot of things. But one of the things my father really did teach me was, don't question me, boy, when I tell you to do something. You know, just do what I tell you. I tell the kids, the kids on my bus, they, kids, that's poor English. The kids on my bus, I tell them, if I tell you to do something, do it. 
because it may come down to what I tell you to be the difference between living and dying. Do what I tell you to do. All right? Now, people have a will. So, well, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. I have to do what you tell me to do. Okay, well, get smashed like a bug. I don't care. You know, you, you, but people have a will. People have a will. Your will, really, when you think about it, your will is what brought you here tonight. Now, the Holy Spirit has a will. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And notice this. Speaking about spiritual gifts. We'll start in verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There's only one Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. One and the same. Now, he gives out different gifts, but there are diversities of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations. But it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Now, Romans chapter 12 makes it very clear that God gives to every man that is saved some gift. That everybody in this room tonight has some spiritual gift. Now, you know, are you using it? For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, which are languages, to another the interpretation of tongues. I'll just pause quickly to say this. I do not believe that is by accident that those come at the very end of the list as a matter of importance. But now verse 11. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. Now, there, there's no explaining how or why the Holy Spirit does what he does and how he gives gifts to people the way he does. There, there really is no explaining that. But you say, I will go to church. I will go to bed. I will eat breakfast. I will eat lunch. I will eat supper. I will eat a midnight snack. I'll eat a 3 o'clock snack. I will. I will. See, the Holy Ghost says, all right, this is what I'm going to do. I will give to Pete Fitzgerald this. I will give to Matt this. I will give to Alex this. I will give to the preacher this. I will. Why, why does he do what he... God knows us. He knows us better than ourselves. You know that God made you the way you are? I've said this before. The highest form of the rejecting of God are people who say, uh, uh, I'm not really a guy. I'm a girl. That is the highest rejection of God. I read this. I'm glad we don't live in Georgia. They, they are. This is, this is scary. They are not going to give building permits to churches anymore unless they have transgender bathrooms in them. You know. But that's the highest form of rejecting of God. But now the Holy Spirit says, you know, I will. This is what I want. A person is made up of a mind, an emotion, a personality, has mind, ability to think, emotions, ability to feel, and the will, ability to do something. Now that's what a person has. That's what makes up a personality. And the Holy Ghost has all three of those. Look at Philippians chapter 1 for a minute. A person, a person, chapter 2, I'm sorry. A person has to be able to fellowship with, one, with somebody else. Hey, hey, don't you like coming to church and talking to people in church? That's pretty good. 
most of the time. You know, it's pretty good. You know, a person, and I, I believe this to be very true. You know, God's pretty smart. I said a couple weeks ago, God didn't send the disciples out two by two. He, I mean, he didn't send them out three by three or one by one. He sent them out two by two. God knew what he was doing. He said, take three people out, go visiting. It's like there's a gang out there in the parking lot, the car, and I think they're going to come in here. No. Two by two. One, it's very difficult to go by yourself. God knew what he was doing. God knew what he was doing when he said, it's not good that man should be alone. And he said, hey, earth man, it's what Adam, it's kind of what it means, made out of the earth. Hey, earth man, how'd you like to help her? Help me. Somebody to complete you. I don't even know what you're talking about, God, but I know the tiger has got a tigress, and I know the gorilla's got a Mrs. Gorilla, and I know I don't have anybody. But if you're talking like something, I think it might be a good idea. God said, okay. Cause that deep sleep to fall upon Adam. Can you imagine how lonely it would have been for Adam to have been in the garden all by himself? Never anybody to talk to. Never anybody to laugh with. Never anybody to share problems with. Men aren't good at sharing problems anyway. I'll say this real quickly. Men, men are pretty good at hiding because they don't want people to see them. And they're afraid for people to see the real them. But that shouldn't change the fact that we should be able to do that. But anyway, it's not good for men to be alone. Man, it's good that we've got a church. It's good that we've got a, a, a people that come here. It, you know, Brother Dewey, said to me, he said, brother, if the only problem you ever have is they shake hands too long, he said, man, he said, that's the right kind of problem to have. A person, uh, someone who is a person likes other people. People who don't get married. And I know not everybody is meant to get married. But people who don't get married die a very and live a very lonely existence. Somebody said this, that people who don't get married die sooner than people who do get married. So the object of that is don't get married and die quickly or get married and die a long, slow death. But, you know, it's like uh, it's very lonely without somebody. And God gave us a church. Now look at Philippians chapter 2. A person likes fellowship. If there be therefore, verse 1, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit. The Spirit likes to fellowship with us. See, that what we're talking about, we know that he's God because Peter made that very clear in 1 Peter uh, or I'm sorry, in uh, Acts chapter 5. He made it very clear. He said, you lied to the Holy Ghost. You not lied to man, but you lied to God. He made it very clear the Holy Ghost is God. And we could see other verses on that. But the Holy Spirit is a person. And he likes the fellowship with us. He likes to come to a church where people are fellowshipping with one another. He likes to come to a church where we can fellowship with him. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians, quickly. Chapter 13. The Holy Spirit is not only God, but the Holy Spirit is a person. Now, he's not a person that we can necessarily see. But he's a person who has a mind, emotions, will, likes to fellowship, and is quite capable of doing that. Verse 14, last chapter, 2 Corinthians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we find the Trinity. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that he is God. He's 
said, again, I, I like, the, the Pharisees claim that he claimed to be God. See, again, I said Sunday, and it's true. Don't let anybody tell you that the church deified Jesus about 300 years after he was here. That's not true. Jesus claimed to be God from the beginning. The Pharisees understood that. For what good work do you stone me? For a good work, we stone thee not, but because thou being a man, makest thyself God. They clearly understood that he claimed to be God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, somebody said that's his full name, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, and we know he is God. And the love of God, and we know he is God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost. See, there's that fellowship thing there with a person. There's that fellowship there. The Holy Spirit is capable of personal relationship. If I said to you tonight, where is Jesus? You say, well, Jesus is here. Well, not really. Now, I'm not saying that Christ is not omnipresent, because now we're going back to the Trinity. But we, we say this, that the Spirit of Christ, we know that Jesus is at the right hand of God tonight, where he's making the intercession for us. We know that. But in the spirit of Christ, we, we often pray, have prayed many times, you know, Lord, we want your presence here. Well, that presence be with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. He'll come and commune with us, fellowship with us. He likes being with us. You know, if you have a really good friend, and, and that, that may be your wife or your husband. It may be, you know, if you're a guy, you may have a guy friend. If you're a girl, you may have another girlfriend. You know, it's like if you really like them, you like being around them. That's what you like. The Holy Spirit can fellowship with us. He can commune with us. He actually can speak to us. Now, we're out of time. I, I doubt seriously, however, having said that, that God actually audibly talks to us in a voice that we can hear. However, however, I can give you several instances of people. I can give you one of this guy. He's no longer here, so I can give you this. He's gone. So where'd he go? He passed through the portal to the other side. Carp told me one time, Bob Carpenter told me one time, he said, Preacher, he said, I've told very few people this. He said, I was somewhere, I, I forget where he even said, he was having some kind of a problem. Some kind. And he said that he audibly heard a voice call his name. Bob. Bob. There was nobody else there. Nobody else was around. Say, so, well, that's kind of spooky, freaky preacher. He said, I've told very few people that. But he said, preacher, there was nobody else there. He said, I am not crazy. He said, God literally spoke to me. I've read accounts of people who have heard when no one else was around. Heard of a man who was saved. When God spoke to him, it was at the end of his rope. He had, you know, to get better, he would have had to have died. I mean, he was that far gone. At the end of his rope, he heard someone speak to him and say, his name is. God loves you. God loves you. The guy was saved shortly after that. Still, still, still going on. Look, the Holy Spirit is a person who loves to commune with us. Rarely will he speak our name. Rarely will he do that. But he still speaks to us. The Spirit of God still speaks to us. Why? Because he has emotions. He has a mind. He has a will. 
He is God. He loves to fellowship with us. He loves to commune with us. The Holy Spirit is God. The third person of the Trinity. You know, here, here, we're, we're fortunate. We have a lot of good people come here and speak. A lot of our own people speak. I read this survey. You believe the Bible is the word of God? Yes. Millennials. Young 20s. Older teenagers. Do you believe the Bible is the word of God? Yes. you believe there's a heaven? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven? No. Now, he's one of the many ways. He is not the way. Thankful tonight for the Holy Spirit of God that shows us the truth. When he is come, he'll guide you all. We've got to stop. Father, we thank you. Again, for this evening, thank you, Lord, for allowing us one more time. Holy Spirit of God, Holy Ghost of God, commune with us, fellowship with us, make yourself real to us. We pray. Now help us, we ask tonight, in our prayer time, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen.